Right, well, welcome to the new semester. I guess it started yesterday, right? Uh, I hope you're here for 742, which is parallel computer architecture. But this is going to be a little bit different from what 742 used to be, because everything is parallel computer architecture today, right? Normally, this, we have the sequence 447, which is the undergraduate course, and then 740, which is the graduate level architecture course. And 742 used to be parallel architecture. It's still parallel architecture, except it won't have that many lectures that I will describe. Previously, we had a lot of lectures, but a lot of them got integrated eventually to 740. So 740 became a class that covers a lot of parallel architecture. There are some things that we didn't cover that I'm going to cover here, maybe not necessarily through lectures, but a lot of readings. So this will be a very research reading oriented course that's relatively informal. So ho hopefully you're here for research. Uh, and you'll get to the project too. So there'll be a lot of interaction in class. So I look forward to that. Maybe we can even change the way we sit in class so that we can interact better. But we'll, we'll figure that out as we go along. So today I'll uh, talk about some of the logistics and I'll ask you to introduce yourselves to actually uh, later on. Maybe we can do that in a little bit after I introduce myself and Yishin. Uh, and then uh, we can go from there. So there won't be any lectures. Uh, well, I'll call these meetings because they're not really lectures. I don't intend to lecture. In fact, in some of the cases that you're, you're going to be talking about papers, as I'll tell you. How many of you have read the syllabus and the website? Not many? OK, you should take a look, because it's a different 742. But it'll be fun, regardless. We'll, we'll talk about a lot of uh, issues in computer architecture today. That, OK. So what, what I intend to cover today is some syllabus, introduction. Well, we'll get to that. And grading and policies, but this, this should be less important than an advan advanced cl uh, class like this. We'll talk about the course project, paper reviews, and talk about some initial assignments and homeworks. So who am I? Well, I think all of you know me, right? OK, I don't need to introduce myself again. But the best way to reach me is my email address, uh, and you can find the papers as well as other stuff that I do on my website. I work on computer architecture systems. Uh, I have a research group that works on a broad range of things related to computer architecture or centered around computer architecture. And we're going to, some of, some of them may give presentations here also. But I think if I have to summarize what I do in research at least is I'm very interested in developing efficient, high performance and scalable systems, uh, solving difficult architectural problems at low cost and complexity. Here, difficult and low cost and complexity are important because I don't want to solve easy problems, and hopefully you should not. Uh, and developing solutions that are too complex to be adopted is not really interesting. Unless there's a path for reducing the complexity right? at some point. But if you uh, look at something that's, not, that's too complex, that's not going to work. Simple is, in general, better uh, than complex. Maybe we should actually read the, uh, th there's a reading uh, paper by Butler Lampson on good system design principles. How many of you have looked at it? That could be a good reading, actually. Yishin, can you put that on the list if you're hearing me? <laughs> okay, that's, that's a good paper that talks about what are good system design principles. And one of the principles is really simplicity. Simple is always, pretty much always better, unless it doesn't work right. But always strive for simple solutions. So hopefully, hopefully I'll, see, uh, I'll see those in your solutions today. Not today, during this course. So who are we? Uh, this is my teaching assistant, uh, Yishin, who's also here. Now you're looking at everyone again. I cannot hear you, but it seems like you can hear us. Right, thank you. OK. Well, he's in China, but he'll be back September 4th, right? Yeah. But the good thing is we want, you'll, you'll do a lot of reading until September 4th so that we can start presentations after that. So we'll not have a lot of lectures. We'll not, we'll not have a lot of meetings until then. OK. Maybe you guys can introduce yourselves in a little bit after I talk more. <laughs> OK. OK. Course website. Let's go to that, actually, since many of you have not been there. Uh, you can find pretty much everything on the course website. And just like in, our, in the previous courses that you've taken from me, you'll see that uh, Okay, that looks okay. Uh, everything will be on the course website. But it's already up. You can reach it from my website. Uh, 
And we'll get, get back to this also. And you can actually access the Blackboard too, if it's, if it's of any use. And you can certainly email uh, us. Whenever you email, it's best if you email me and Yashin, unless you want only one of us to know something. You'll get much, <laughs> much faster response if you email both of us. In fact, probably uh, if you email Yashin, you get much, even faster response. But. OK, let's see. Course location. Uh, yeah, this is going to be the default room, but it's not available all the time. And we'll have, our meetings will be relatively irregular in the sense that we'll schedule them. Uh, the, the, the slots that are assigned will, be, will respect those slots. It's Monday, Wednesday, Monday, Tuesday. No, it's Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, right? Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, 10.30 to 12.30. But sometimes this room is not available, so we'll probably find some other room, uh, the, the scheduled room on the uh, syllabus. But those rooms are not great for recording, apparently. That's what Dave tells me. So we'll probably make do as much as we can. But the default room is here. So by default, you should come here, but check your email. And definitely during class, I'll announce uh, wh where the meetings will be. So uh, background required, and then I'll get back to this. You must have taken at least one of 447 or 740. This is an advanced course. In fact, if you've taken both, that's the best. But you must have taken either one of these to attend, unless you have a really special permission from me. But that's, that's going to be hard to get. That's relatively easy to get from, for 740, but it's, it's hard to get for a course like this because the, there are no lectures really in this course. It's really a course designed for research if you're really enthusiastic about computer architecture, right? Uh, or a related field and you want to do uh, research uh, in computer architecture plus something related. And since many of you have already taken these two, you know where these things are. So if you would like to refresh your background at any time, you can go back to these sites and look at the lectures, either videos, course materials, anything, uh, anything you want over there, except for the solutions to the assignments, uh, solutions to the programming labs, but you don't need them for this course. So hopefully you mastered those uh, labs in 447. OK. And the other background really is uh, the interest and enthusiasm to do or at least explore research. That's really needed in this course because you'll do a lot of reading. And if you're not really interested or enthusiastic, it's not necessarily a good thing to do all that reading. OK, so the focus is on research. And this is actually, I copied this from uh, the syllabus. So where is the syllabus? I'll keep going back and forth. So the syllabus is also online. And you can find a lot of information here. So I copied this overview from the syllabus. Let me go over this. Uh, basically, the major components of this course, the, the goal is to provide a strong experience and research in computer architecture via multiple things. The first is a rigorous, self-driven, semester-long research project. Self meaning multiple people can work together, but you can do it on your own also. All of the projects need to be approved by me. We'll get to that. Critical research article reviews. We'll be reading a lot of papers. In 740, you've read a lot of papers, but you haven't presented them as much. So we'll be doing that here also, and we'll be having discussions about the papers. So hopefully, if you're doing research in this area, this should be really useful, or in a related area. And I'll give you some freedom to select the papers also. So if you're interested in some things, uh, and the paper is, of course, approved by me, then we can all read it and review it. Uh, well, that's the, this part also. In-class research article presentations and discussions. A literature survey, we'll talk about that, but uh, this will probably be related to your project. Uh, so hopefully, it's kind of the related work section of your project. And other assignments that focus on developing critical thinking, idea development, and clear explanation and presentation skills. So we'll focus on this presentation and explanation skills, certainly. Hopefully, this course will be helpful in developing some of that, too. Well, I, I don't want to repeat this, probably. <laughs> so you should be highly motivated and self driven in all aspects of this course. Because there, there won't be assignments like 447. Right? 447 is different, but you'll, you'll have different assignments. OK, I don't know if I want to go through all of this, but there are two major components. One is papers, analysis, review, and in-class presentation and discussion of research papers and research seminars. So I'll ask you to attend some seminars in computer architecture. Those will be required. And we'll, we'll have some uh, people from industry as well as academia coming and giving talks. So we'll, we'll do reviews and we'll do discussions of those talks as well during class. 
And most of the class time will really be dedicated to such presentations and discussions. Right? And uh, you will read and present both recent as well as established research papers, uh, write reviews for them. We'll have a review website that I'll go to. Go to. Actually, that's the review website that's used for most conferences today in systems. Uh, whenever people submit papers, uh, reviewers actually submit their reviews through that website. So we've set, a, set that up. Ishin has set that up. So you're, you're, you're going to submit reviews. Uh, so I expect to assign at least two presentations per week. I don't know. We'll, we'll adjust that dynamically, probably. Uh, and I'll, I'll, I'll do some presentations also. Uh, would it be useful if I did a presentation? No. Nobody has an opinion at this point. <laughs> Maybe we should introduce ourselves so that <laughs> you'll, you'll have more opinions. Uh, so lectures will be minimal, if any at all. I'll point you to online lectures. Uh, but mo most of the class time will be dedicated to discussions. OK, I think you can read the rest. The second component is uh, the semester-long research project. This is similar to 740 in that sense. It's, you, you can actually continue the 740 project if you've done. Some, some of the students in the past have done that. They've started a project in 740, and they were so excited to do more that they came and took 742 and completed the project and actually have written papers at top conferences, which I'll show you uh, later on. And the go goal will be to substantially advance the state of the art in computer architecture. This may sound like a big goal, but now you have all the background in computer architecture to do that, right? If you've taken only 447, actually, you're, you, you have that uh, background, in my opinion, uh, to be able to do this. And of course, I need to approve the project. We'll give you a list of project ideas. And I'll actually give you some readings that uh, is targeted towards uh, giving you some ideas on what problems would be important, potentially, to work on. Uh, and uh, if you've taken 740, you'll need to, uh, sim similarly to that, you'll need to do a project proposal. We'll have milestone presentations, a literature survey report. This doesn't necessarily need to be related to your project, but I would encourage you to do so, because that way you can actually amortize uh, uh, the costs and the expertise in actually doing your project. Uh, and presentation, probably. So a lot of these will be dynamically determined. This is kind of my vision right now, but maybe you won't have time for presenting all of the literature surveys, right? Uh, and also, it'll depend on the feedback that I get from you uh, over time. But there will definitely be a final project report. And in the past, many people have used these as uh, submissions to conferences. And some of them got accepted at top places like ISCA uh, or Micro. I don't know if we'll do all of this. Uh, we may do a poster as well. Uh, but I, I'd probably favor reports and presentations. But we'll see. We'll adjust dynamically. Does this sound good? Is this interesting? Maybe. <laughs> OK. OK. And the hope is that uh, you'll conduct research that are likely publishable or publishable at some point. They don't necessarily need to be at the end of three months, right? OK. Any questions so far? Everybody is very quiet. Maybe we should go around the room and introduce ourselves quickly. Where do we want to start? Do we want to start, Joseph? Uh, okay. <laughs> okay. I'm Joseph Krohs. I'm an MS IMB in EC. And that sounds great. Yeah. And you've taken 447, I'm right? 447. Worked at NVIDIA last summer in an architecture group. Oh, OK. Which group was that? Agro System Architecture. OK. That sounds interesting. We should talk. <laughs> OK. And you also worked at industry for a while, right? Yeah, I've been in the industry for almost nine years. Nice. Okay. I'm very old. All right. <laughs> <laughs> so my name is Tom Jones. I'm from China. I've taken 447 and MSIMB. All right, cool. And you, you, you actually didn't have enough torture in 447 that you're back. You too. <laughs> OK. In a GPU team with Microsoft. In, in NVIDIA? No, uh, MediaTek. Oh, OK. Well, you, should, you guys should talk. You're from the same company. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right. <laughs> sure. And you've done some research before. Cool. I'm here as an undergraduate 
Yeah. <laughs> and you're so interested in the course that you would like to attend, <laughs> maybe remotely. Project related to that? Maybe? Okay. <laughs> Cool. <laughs> I'm Prakash, I'm a master's student in AC, and I'm taking 747. Okay. Cool. So we have a good group. People have taken 447 or 740 or both, and people are doing research in related areas or computer architecture. So this should be fun. <laughs> well, you'll get to lo know each other more during the course. Okay. So let me move on. Uh, I'll, I'll talk about some example project problems because I would like to really, uh, you to really start thinking about uh, projects. Uh, and I'll assign some readings toward the end of the course uh, so that you can actually uh, try to develop project ideas. So one example project problem, you've taken my course so you're bored of this probably. <laughs> but it's really related to multi-core systems. Uh, and interference at multi-core systems is a big problem. So you, uh, this is a really old picture from AMD Barcelona. You have multiple cores, and they may have some private caches, but they have some shared caches and shared structures and shared storage interface also. And I've shown you many times this picture, probably. I don't know how many times you've seen it in 447. And if you've taken both 447 and 740, you've seen this probably at least five times. Now you can actually recite, that, <laughs> recite it, probably. But basically, if you run multiple applications together on the uh, on a multi-core si system that is where the cores are sharing resources, you get slowdowns that are really unfair. And this is the slowdown of each application compared to when it's run alone on the same system. Right, this is MATLAB. Th these are real results, actually. That was reported in the Usenix security paper that I'll mention in a couple of slides. Uh, and this is a problem because if you want to enforce priorities, it doesn't work. Basically, you can go into the operating system and say MATLAB is low priority, but GCC is high priority, you get the same slowdowns because the operating system has scheduled the applications uh, to the two cores and they're running. And the operating system doesn't really deschedule them whenever you deprioritize them. And that may not be the right thing to do anyway. Right? So you cannot enforce priorities. At the same time, exploit the parallelism that's provided by these multiple cores. And this is because some application is hogging uh, the memory system. Right? This is generating lots of requests that is delaying the requests of GCC. And in this particular case, What's happening is MATLAB is generating a lot of requests with good locality. GCC is once in a while generating requests that may or may not have good locality, but the DRAM memory controller is unfairly prioritizing MATLAB because it's really not aware of these different cores. It's really not aware of these different hardware contexts that are generating requests. So this is a problem, obviously, if you would like to achieve high system performance. One core is basically doing nothing almost, but waiting for its request for a long time. And in fact, this may be the core you want to prioritize at the memory controller because it once in a while generates requests. And if you actually service its request, it will go back and do a lot of computation until it generates the next request, right? Right now, you're doing exactly the opposite thing by being unfair in the memory controller because the memory controller is doing, using an oldest first policy. Right? And you remember the policies from 740 or 447, right? It could be uh, uh, many controllers today prioritize row hits over row misses and conflicts to minimize DRAM latency and maximize DRAM throughput. And as a result, you get this unfairness. And many controllers also prioritize older requests over younger requests. As a result, if an application is generating lots of requests, it'll request, its requests are appearing uh, older uh, to the memory controller. So you have an unfairness problem. And we actually uh, done this. This was not a course project in 447 or, or in, in 742. 
But uh, you read this paper. I had assigned this a long time ago uh, uh, in, in Psalm 40. But you may read it again if you haven't read it, so don't worry about it. Uh, basically, uh, this is a problem. And this problem will become even worse. And I'd encourage you to potentially think about projects in this direction. Why would it become even worse? Well, we already have systems like this, right? Systems are not, do not have only uh, multiple cores, but they may have heterogeneous cores, in fact. I should change this picture such that you have different kinds of CPUs with different power and performance. Uh, they may share some levels of cache, maybe not all levels. Uh, there, there are some uh, GPUs, other accelerators in the system, like video accelerators, imaging accelerators. And they all share the memory system, um, they, or portions of the memory system. They may share some caches. For example, CPU and GPU can actually share caches, and people are look, uh, there, there's research in that area. Uh, that's happening. Uh, and uh, yeah, they, they share some memory controllers. And the memory is also complicated, right? The memory is not a uniform system. We've talked about DRAM uh, in past courses. And you know the structure of DRAM. It's a hierarchical structure. But we're adding other memories into the system today also. You don't have only one type of memory, but you may have multiple types. In fact, we've talked about DRAM plus non-volatile memory, right? Some emerging memory technology. Maybe that's a little bit out into the future, but today people are considering adding multiple types of DRAM into the system. Some DRAM that's much closer to the processor, stacked on top of the processor, that has high bandwidth, low latency, relatively energy efficient, uh, uh, but low capacity, because you cannot stack a lot of memory on top of the processor due to the thermal issues. And some other DRAM, again, still the same underlying technology is the same, it's still DRAM, that's a little bit far away, low bandwidth, low latency, because it's not uh, low, low bandwidth, high latency, because it's not stacked on top of the processor, right? Stacking on top of the processor enables a lot of uh, through silicon vias such that you can have a lot more bandwidth uh, on top of the processor. Whereas if you're connected through the pins, traditional pins, then you don't have memory, uh, your, your memory becomes uh, farther away. Uh, but, but that mem memory can be made a lot higher capacity. Now you have a trade off, right? You have hybrid memories over here and different memory controllers for them. Then the key question is how do you actually provide uh, mechanisms for reducing memory interference between all of these agents in the presence of these multiple memory technologies? How do you allocate resources, not only memory controller, but also shared cache, perhaps, to provide predictable performance? I think this is a really good problem. And I'd encourage you, some, of, uh, some, of, some of you to look into this problem. So one solution approach, I'm not suggesting that you should uh, do this for your project if you choose to work on this. But I think one, one good solution approach, well, go, goal, uh, this is actually kind of like a project proposal if you, uh, if you think of this right. Uh, basically, the goal is to satisfy performance or service level agreement requirements in the presence of shared memory, memory pre prefetchers, heterogeneous agents, and hybrid memory storage. This is a huge project, of course. You cannot finish this in three months. So you should probably pick and choose some of these things. Maybe shared mem main memory is enough, right, with hybrid memory. And the approach, the solution approach could be developing models to accurately estimate the performance of an application or agent, maybe the CPU and GPU, in the presence of resource sharing, and developing mechanisms that are driven by these models to enable the resource partitioning and prioritization needed to achieve the required performance levels. Once you have, once you know the slowdowns of different applications based on the models that you've developed, you can prioritize these applications differently in the memory control such that you can achieve a slowdown guarantee. Right? That's, that's kind of the goal. And all the while providing high system performance, of course, right? If, if this is not a concern, then it's really easy to do. Then you just, again, as I've said before, you can run only one application in this complex system. Only one CPU will be utilizing the system, and everything else will be idle. And you, you can guarantee performance. But that's not interesting, right? That's not an engineering solution. That could be a good marketing solution, maybe. You, 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 you sell all, all, all these cores, but only one of them is utilized, right? <laughs> OK. <laughs> So this is one potential uh, project problem, in my opinion. Of course, you'll need to delve uh, a little bit deeper into this. And if you're interested in this problem, I would recommend uh, my student Lavanya's paper that actually does this at a very limited form, basically by looking at main memory and by looking at memory scheduling only. So basically, his obs uh, her observation was that you can estimate the slowdown of an application by estimating the request service rate it gets from the memory system. And the request service rate uh, basically correlates. You, you can use request service rate as a proxy for performance. And if you estimate the request service rate that you get while you're sharing resources versus request service rate that you get if you were running alone, now you can estimate the slowdown by dividing those two values, right? 
Now the difficulty is how do you estimate the request service rate when you're running alone? And you can read the paper for details. That's, the, that's where the innovation comes in actually. Um, well, additional innovation comes in. And he, she basically used this to drive a memory scheduling policy that tries to uh, satisfy the slowdowns uh, of different applications now that you've estimated the slowdown by using request service rate. So this shows an example project uh, that can potentially be uh, carved out of this huge resource direction. Right? Okay, I'll give you a few other ones. Uh, so there are many project ideas here. So even you, looking at prefetchers could be interesting. Looking at hardware accelerators could be interesting. Looking at providing quality of service when you have uh, multiple different types of DRAM could be interesting. Right? If you have multiple applications sharing multiple different types of DRAM, which application or how do you design an application aware management policy for the different types of memory? Right? That's, that's pretty interesting. Not necessarily DRAM plus NVM. OK. So there are other examples over here. Uh, another paper that I would recommend, and actually you may read uh, based on what I've, uh, what I've assigned, is Roclone. How many of you know this? Some of you. OK. You've, you've taken class or read the papers. But not, me, not all of you. So I'll, I'll recommend that you will read this. This is basically a fast uh, way of copying pages in DRAM. But building upon this, let's say, uh, I, I've shown you this picture in a different way before. You have this complicated heterogeneous system, right? You have multiple cores that are potentially heterogeneous. Well, I guess this is the mini CPUs here, but maybe you have many, many mini CPU cores over here. Some other accelerators uh, and some GPUs over here that are sharing part of the memory system. And you, if you, you can think of all of this as doing computation, right? And they're doing computation on different pieces of the code. Traditionally, memory has been thought of as a unit of storage, right? It's not an active piece of uh, the system. If you think about it, it doesn't do any computation. It's just, it just sits there. It's kind of dumb. You just give it commands, addresses, and it gives you back data. And then data gets shipped. All data needs to get shipped across the memory bus such that you can do computation over here. Well, that may not be a good idea, right? Especially. Uh, well, shipping all the data all the time to the computation units that are only here may not be a good idea because this is really a critical bottleneck, right? Especially with data intensive workloads, this bus is becoming an even bigger bottleneck, not in terms of bandwidth and latency, but also in terms of energy. It turns out most of the energy in memory system is really consumed in this huge interconnect that, uh, that you need to drive between memory and CPUs. So one other direction where you can actually find a lot of project ideas from is uh, thinking of memory as not a dumb device, but more of an accelerator, right? More of something that can do some, more, some computation, maybe some specialized computation to reduce cost, but enough computation such that you can have a better balance in the system, right? So maybe, it may, in fact, this could be a really good accelerator, right? Because it has access to this huge store, data store. It's very tightly coupled with data. Uh, so if you're actually doing a lot of scans through data, maybe it's a good idea to do it over here instead of bringing all the data over here. Right? Then the key question is actually how do you design this substrate to do uh, things at low cost? So this is a, a really a good project direction in my opinion. I, I haven't given you any ideas, so it's up to you to develop some of the ideas. But So one, 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 one example that I'll give you is somehow enabling search. There are a lot of potential research directions that I'll uh, show you over here. Uh, let's say you have this processor core and memory, and memory stores a database. Let's say it could be of images, right? Uh, and uh, a better way of designing the system may be processor sends a query, if, you're, if it's searching for an image, maybe it sends the hash of the image to the memory, and memory has the mechanisms to search that hash in parallel in this database. Right? And then it can report back some results to the processor core saying, oh, these are the images that, can ma that matched this hash, or that potentially match this hash. Maybe the memory does this computation in an approximate way. Maybe it doesn't do it in a perfect way, right? Because perfect way may lead to uh, a lot of logic over here. But if you do some approximate search, approximate filtering, maybe with some analog mechanisms over here, you can provide some results that are filtered, but you do most of the computation, most of the heavy lifting here, such that the data transfer that you do from memory to the processor core is very little. That way you can reduce energy, you can reduce the bandwidth requirements, you can reduce the latency of the search because you're actually doing most of it very close to the data over here instead of bringing all, everything to the processor. Right? And you can have a much better system balance. There are many, many questions related to this. And 
you could potentially take an application and so there, uh, you could potentially take an application and try to do this, or you could from the bottom up, start from the bottom up. What are the primitives in the memory that you want to support to achieve something like this? And how do you actually partition the computation capability between processor core and memory? I'll tell you, tell you about uh, some of these questions, but you can, you can pick up these if you're interested uh, in this direction. What is the right low-cost memory substrate? How do you actually do the comparisons, for example, in memory? In a technology like DRAM, how do you do the comparisons efficiently? Right. Um, and maybe there are many, many ways of doing this. How, how do you do this in a hybrid memory cube? Right? Hybrid memory cube is where you actually stack DRAM with the logic. That's one example of it. How do you actually do it there? And how do you actually do it in traditional DRAM? So these are actually open questions. Roclone, the paper that I mentioned, does copying of a, a, a page to another page within DRAM, but it doesn't do computation. right? And maybe there are other technologies that are best enablers. So the paper I'll assign you will talk about some technologies. Uh, but maybe uh, some other, looking at some other technologies is very interesting also. There, uh, there's STT MRAM, Spin Transfer Torque MRAM, which is very promising as a memory technology today. It may be much more suitable than DRAM to do this because it actually tightly integrates logic and memory. So perhaps looking into doing some computation for an interesting application within STT MRAM is a good project. And then, I, I'm, I'm not sure if you can get to it, but this is... Uh, once you have a substrate that can actually do computation, how do you design the algorithms and the applications for that? So I'll give you one example. If, today, if you do page copies at 4 kilobyte granularity, it takes a really long time. In fact, if you do it through the DMA, uh, my student Vivek's results, he's the co-author on that paper that I mentioned earlier, uh, his results show that it takes about 1,046 nanoseconds to do a 4 kilobyte page copy. It's one microsecond, right? It's, it's actually pretty slow. So as a result, many software designers try to avoid these page copies. So it's hard to find applications that do very, a lot of copies. Even the, in the networking stack where you need a lot of copies, people try to avoid these page copies. But if your page copy becomes 90 nanoseconds instead of 1,046 nanoseconds, almost a 12x improvement, then maybe you have a different way of designing the application. Now the application doesn't need to try to avoid those copies, right? So this is one example. If you, if you actually can do search in memory, maybe there's a b better way of designing the application, right? OK. So this is kind of the re one re other research direction that I think could be potentially uh, interesting. There are other uh, project topics. I'll give you some other examples. And emerging memory technologies is one example. Uh, we covered this in both 447 and 740, so you know what they are, right? There are some technologies that are potentially more scalable than DRAM, and they also are non-volatile, right? You can have non-volatile memory that's almost as fast as DRAM that is close to the processor today. Well, maybe not today, maybe in a few years. So Flash is non-volatile, but it's not uh, like the other technologies that we've talked about. Uh, flash, because flash latency is uh, high and flash uh, bandwidth is low. But there are some other technologies that can potentially be very interesting, like phase change memory that we've talked about, STTM RAM against spin transfer torque RAM. Its latencies are... Uh, almost the same as DRAM, except for the write latencies. Write latencies are usually higher uh, in these technologies. Uh, but the premise of these technologies is you can have non-volatile storage that's very close to, uh, uh, to uh, the processor. In fact, you can use this as a non-volatile memory, right? persistent memory. Uh, so you don't need to write data all the way to disk or all the way to flash if you want data to persist. So there are many opportunities, I believe, in this direction also. I'll talk about this over here, uh, because there are many, many research questions over here. But there are new applications. You can potentially, for example, if you have a really good idea of what you can do with uh, very fast, byte addressable, non-volatile memory that's really close to the processor, what are the new applications that you can, you can enable? If you have a good idea here, I would definitely, I, I will probably encourage you to do a project on this one. But people have looked at ultra-fast checkpointing and restore, for example. People have looked at speeding up boot up, for example. Those are interesting, but maybe there's something else that's really interesting. Right? More robust system design. If you have non-volatile memory that's really fast, maybe your system will become more robust. Right? So you can reduce data loss. Because whenever you write data to a disk, uh, and if you have a system crash, you need to somehow ensure that you're consistent. Right? You, uh, you need to have enough time to actually write all the volatile data that you've cached to disk before your system actually really goes down. Right? So to be able to do that, today's systems, today's systems are actually not that great at doing that, unless you're designing a system that's uh, supposed to be available. Uh, 
So if you have one non-volatile memory that's really close to the processor, this becomes an easier problem, right? Uh, because it's really fast to write that data. And uh, as I told you, some of these technologies like STTM RAM uh, potentially enable processing really tightly coupled with the memory because they integrate logic and memory together. So maybe uh, doing this is interesting. So I'll talk about this very briefly because uh, I think there are a lot of ideas over here, but this doesn't mean that uh, I'm dismissing all of these. So one thing, uh, if you look at systems today, uh, they consist of a two-level storage model, right? You have volatile data that's stored in main memory, traditionally DRAM, and that's accessed through a load store interface. When you do programming, you can access an array that's in memory, right, main memory. Uh, and if you look at this interface, this is really heavily accelerated in hardware. We've covered all of this in 447, right, virtual memory. You know, you know about TLBs. All of that is to accelerate access to main memory and to do the address translation, to do the protection. Everything pretty much is in hardware, right? In fact, x86 processors have page walkers, one of the most, most complicated parts of the processor to design, uh, that do the page translation in hardware. Uh, because this technology is really fast, right? You don't want to waste any cycles. If you needed to access main memory, whenever you need to do a load, you need to go through a software Think about a virtual memory system that does translation through the software. Well, without any TLB. That would be horrible, right? That's the purpose of a TLB, hardware TLB. On the other hand, persistent data is accessed through a totally different interface. It's stored in this storage unit, hard disks traditionally, but more recently SSDs, like flash. Uh, and it's accessed via a totally different interface, a file system interface. right? And that's very different. right? You cannot declare an array that stays here in, in many programming languages today. If you want to manage this, you really need to manage it through files. And maybe that's a good idea. But the access mechanism over here is through the file system interface. So you have this operating system and file system code that you need to go through to access this device. Right? And that actually takes a lot of time. And the, that, that was an OK decision, perhaps, if this device takes very, very long to access. right? If the amount of time it takes to access the device uh, trumps the amount of time uh, it takes to do all of these system calls, maybe it's OK, right? But if your device becomes as fast as main memory, as fast as DRAM, for example, phase change memory, STTM RAM, then you have a problem, right? This is really fast, and you're wasting a lot of cycles to go through this file system and operating system calls to access the device. And those codes to locate, translate, and buffer data actually become performance and energy bottlenecks if your non-volatile memory persistent storage is really fast. So one project idea, this is actually one direction, uh, you can read this paper. Uh, we, we made a case for uh, unifying these uh, two systems such that both memory and storage are actually accessible through a load store interface. Maybe you still keep the file system abstraction at the programming level, but you translate everything to load stores through this interface such that you don't have this overhead in accessing the device. Uh, this eliminates a lot of wasted work to locate, translate, uh, and transfer data. And I'll show you some brief results. And you should re read this paper if you're really interested in this. Uh, it improves both energy and performance. And it may simplify programming model as well at some point if you change the programming model. Right? If you actually change the interface such that uh, you don't go through the file system calls. So what, what, what is required to actually do this? We call this the persistent memory manager. Uh, you need to somehow build something like this. And this actually requires a lot, right? Because file systems today do a lot. They ensure that files are consistent. They ensure security across the files. Uh, and you need to do this in this unit now that's accessible through loads and stores. Uh, so we'd like to expose a load store interface to access persistent data. This may not be the interface that's seen by the programmer. So you can think of interfaces Let's see. These are hiding somewhere. OK. You can th think of interfaces as a programmer's interface. And you can use file system calls over here. But then that can get translated through a very lightweight translation layer, maybe hardware, uh, to loads and stores, right, to access the persistent memory. Or the programmer can directly program with loads and stores to access the persistent memory. So you can actually have multiple interfaces right, to, to persistent memory. But you, you can store both volatile data 
and persistent data in persistent memory. So the, uh, the, the goal is to have this load store interface and design this persistent memory manager to actually do this really efficiently such that you don't go through the file system and operating system codes. And another goal, potentially, if you keep this interface, how do you actually do this translation efficiently such that you don't, uh, you don't actually have a lot of overheads? So if you actually discuss this paper, there are a lot of things to discuss uh, over here. So this could be pretty interesting as a potential paper discussion. Okay. So this enables, if you actually do this, the applications can now directly access persistent memory. There are no conversion, translation, and location overheads for persistent data. And the hope is that this persistent memory manager now has a lot of the functionality of the file systems, right? It manages data placement, location, persistence, and security. And this is a lot, right? A lot to manage. If you look at a file system today, and if you're interested in this, I would definitely encourage you to look at the file systems. Uh, they do a lot of things. And how, the question is, how do you do this really efficiently such that you don't waste the 50 nanosecond access time by going through a file system interface that's like two milliseconds. Actually, it's not two milliseconds. It's, it's, it's faster than that, but you get the point, right? You're, you have this device that's 50 nanoseconds. You don't want to go through that two millisecond interface. It needs to match metadata storage and retrieval. What if you have a huge file system, right? How do you actually keep track of information related to that? And expose hooks and interface to the system software. So this is one example. This actually assumes a different programming model if you look at this. Uh, and this is uh, in the paper. But you do not necessarily need to have this programming model. As I said, you can have a file system interface that gets translated to loads and stores through a separate path here. But basically, you have this person memory manager that manages a heterogeneous array of devices. It definitely needs to have hardware support. Even, I mean, if virtual memory today has hardware support, this has to have hardware support, right? There's no way you can build this really efficiently without hardware support if your memory is 50 nanoseconds. Uh, and the key question is basically, how do you design this? There are a lot of research topics here. If you're excited about this, this is another potential project topic. Uh, there, uh, people have actually looked at this kind of programming models before. So one way of programming this uh, without, while changing the file system interface is by using persistent objects. And that's another topic area. So if you're interested, let me know also. So what are the potential benefits? Whenever you're designing a system like this, it's always good to think about. What can, what can I gain right, uh, based on this? Because you don't want to undertake this design if you don't gain much. And I would encourage you to, in all of your projects, to think about ideal results. Right? What if I solve this problem? You, you state this problem really clearly. And then the first, one of the first questions, uh, I guess one of the first questions is, has anyone solved this problem? And how is my solution approach different? But the second question also, also is, is the problem really important today, given the solutions before? And, uh, you can answer that question by solving the problem ideally, doing an ideal experiment that looks at the potential benefit you would get if you solved it perfectly. Right? For example, if you uh, have a pipeline processor, uh, a superscalar processor, let's say you want to work on the branch prediction problem. right? You can do this study easily. What if I had a perfect branch predictor? What if everything was predicted perfectly? You can simulate that using a simulator and look at the performance difference or energy difference uh, that you would get compared to a state-of-the-art branch predictor that you actually implement in the simulator. And you can say, oh, the difference is 50%. So I'm going to look at this problem, right? 50% is not bad, actually. <laughs> if the difference was 10%, uh, maybe it's not that interesting, right? Then, you, then it doesn't mean that it's a bad thing, right? Again, it's all, well, you're doing research, so you should probably consider, is this difference going to stay 10%, right? Or is this difference going to increase into the future? given the trends, right? So for example, if you look at DRAM refresh today, the performance and energy that you spend on DRAM refresh is not that high if you look at the overall uh, scheme of things. Uh, but if you look at the scaling trend, DRAM refresh is going to become a much bigger issue in the future. So if you do the ideal experiment of eliminating all the refreshes in the system, the energy and performance benefit that you get today is perhaps about maybe 15, 20%. But if trends continue, DRAM refresh is going to be a critical limiter of uh, DRAM scaling. As you uh, design a much larger DRAM chip, you'll need to refresh it more often because you have more rows in the DRAM chip. And because you need to scale the size of the circuit, the DRAM refresh rate will increase. So it's more likely that you'll get a lot more refreshes with a larger chip. So if you do the same ideal experiment with a 64 gigabit DRAM chip as opposed to a 4 gigabit DRAM chip that we have today, Refresh constitutes 
50% of the energy of DRAM at the 64 gigabit node. And there are some papers that you can look at uh, that shows that. So it's always good to, as an architect, as a person who is doing research, it's always good to think of the future, not today, right? Today, it may not be a big problem. But future, well, it can be a big problem, right? And you're always designing systems for the future for workloads that you do not, do not know. That's the beauty of research, right? <laughs> so always think about the future, not, not, not get stuck in today. Because today, yeah, a lot of things may not look like a problem. And if you work in industry, they may tell you that that's not a problem. But if you look into the future, you can actually design the systems of the future. OK. Well, in this case, this is today, actually, I think, <laughs> although persistent memory doesn't exist. So this is one example with Postmark. Again, you can read it from the paper that I mentioned, the wheat paper. Uh, this is what happens to this workload when you execute, uh, you have the storage as hard disk, and you have a two-level storage model. Most of the time is really spent on accessing the device. And it's not very well clear here, but it's uh, most of the time spent on accessing the device. If you actually replace hard disk with something like phase change memory, all of your persistent data is now in phase change memory, you get a 24x speed up. And uh, the, most of the bottleneck now shifts to the system calls, right? Because the device access is really fast. Now, this is still managed using a two level storage model between persistent data and volatile data. You have file system interface. Now, if you get rid of the file system interface and actually manage everything through loads and stores that are accelerated in hardware, you get a 5x more speed up. So, the potential benefit of changing the interface is 5x. But actually, even this is not perfect because you can do better by having a heterogeneous array of devices over here. I believe this doesn't even have DRAM in the system. So if you add DRAM in the system and manage data even better, perhaps you can get much more than 5x. So the performance potential over here is really 5x plus something that's really hard to uh, quantify. So this tells you that maybe it's a good idea to look into this resource direction. Right? And once you propose your project, uh, if you can motivate it based on ideal data, like this, that would be really interesting. Sometimes you may not be able to get the ideal data, right? Here, you can get the ideal data by ch changing the simulator such that the file system calls are converted to loads and stores, and you don't have a lot of overhead. In fact, you can vary that overhead. If you look at the paper, the overhead is varied in terms of number of cycles. Uh, sometimes you may not be able to do that, right? For example, with memory scheduling, it's really tough, especially if you have multiple applications sharing memory, and you would like to get the ideal performance improvements that you can potentially gain with the best memory scheduler you can design. Well, that's really tough, right? Because what is ideal? First of all, you have different applications. And how do you actually do the best scheduling? It's really a dynamic problem. It's very difficult to solve, especially if you're optimizing for multiple metrics. Then motivating that problem is, with, the, with an ideal result is difficult. But then you can also show sensitivity, right? Then you need to motivate it in an intuitive way. You can, you can say existing memory schedulers do this, but they're very bad at this. So I'm going to try to design a memory scheduler that's good at this. And I'll let you figure out what that this is. This, for example, in the previous one, I, I said strong memory service guarantees. Existing memory schedulers are really good at perhaps performance improvement, but they're not very good at providing strong guarantees to different applications. Now that gives you a project idea. OK, I'll skip this over here. But basically, energy, uh, you, can do the, you can do perfect energy studies as well. And this shows that this is the total energy uh, in the memory system. And total energy also improves if you actually get rid of the two-level interface. OK, there are many other potential project topics. I'll uh, flash this. I've talked about memory system quite a bit, but that's not the only thing, right? Uh, and uh, I, I'd be happy to chat with you. These are some of the project topics that actually I'm really interested in exploring and that uh, I'm exploring in my research group. There are other ones as well. Uh, but certainly memory system design. I've talked about DRAM and emerging technologies, but flash memory is really interesting also. So if you have ideas there, that's interesting. I've talked about single level stores. By the way, I'll, I'll, I'll digress a little bit. If you're really interested in this, this is not necessarily a new idea. People have designed single level stores where memory and storage are managed using a single interface for a long time. Atlas computer, for example. That could be a paper that we should read. Uh, you should take a, take a note of that if you're still there. <laughs> Uh, Atlas Computer had that kind of interface, right? It's a single level store. It didn't have this distinction between file systems and memory uh, because you had a huge chunk of memory that's persistent, right? Uh, recently, well, recently, meaning 1970s, late 1970s, uh, IBM AS400 is another system that actually tried to do single level stores. 
And their motivation was very similar, except they didn't have the really fast memory technology. Their motivation was from a system efficiency perspective. In fact, I would recommend, if you're interested in this direction, uh, I would recommend Frank Soltis's paper, uh, well, book. Frank Soltis, he, he's a distinguished IBM engineer, who has a book uh, called Inside the AS400. That basically discusses a lot of the aspects of this AS400 system that IBM uh, designed. And one of the pro uh, prominent components was a single level store. And if you read uh, the parts of this book that talk about the motivation for the single level store, he basically says very similar things. Today, if we want to manipulate persistent data, we first need to bring it all the way to memory, do stuff to it, and we, we need to uh, copy it back all the way to persistent store. In the meantime, we expose it to all of these problems uh, related to non-volatility. So why don't we get rid of it by actually doing loads and stores and accessing persistent memory through loads and stores? Now, the difference today is we have these technologies that are much, much faster and that provide persistence, non-volatility at the same time. So we actually need to do hardware management. They didn't do a whole lot of hardware management over here. They had, they had a nice virtual machine translation layer to be able to do that. But I would definitely recommend this book. It's, it's really a nice, nicely written book that talks about this. OK, digression, end of digression. <laughs> So there are other, other projects, definitely. GPUs, for example, uh, are definitely very interesting. How can we enable them to become first-class computing engines? It's actually a project that I have. Uh, and I think this is really interesting also. Uh, there are many problems to be solved there, uh, especially when you have heterogeneous CPU and GPU systems together. How do you actually uh, do the programming? How do you actually support enough, uh, provide enough support for programming, maybe coherence as well, and maybe other things? In memory computing, we've kind of talked about that. Predictable systems, we've talked about that also. Uh, secure memories, how do you provide security in some of these technologies? There, there are issues with uh, security in memory. And we'll, we'll talk about that later. You can take a look at the paper that we've discussed. Certainly heterogeneous systems. How do you actually manage heterogeneous architectures? If you have, uh, well, GPUs plus CPUs is one of them. But if you have large cores versus small cores, who should execute what? Right. How do you actually exploit that to maximize energy and performance? How do you provide enough programming support such that people can program this nicely? Interconnects is another potential direction. So there are many, many potential directions. And this is something that I'm personally interested in. How do you actually design algorithms and architectures for genome sequence analysis and assembly that's aware of the underlying architecture? Uh, OK. But we can definitely talk about these. This is just to give you an idea of memory is not the only thing. It's maybe a really big thing. but you can do projects in other things. And I'm open to your ideas on projects as well. So this is just to give you some motivation. These are some of the sample past projects from 740 and 742 that were eventually published. I was preparing the slide late at 3 AM yesterday. So I, 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 it may not have all of the projects, but these are at least uh, some that were published. So you can see that. Uh, and this doesn't mean that they were published right at the end of the semester, right? Because you can continue the research and actually get it public, published. So you can see best paper awards and top conferences over here. OK, any questions so far? I feel like I'm lecturing all the time. It's not supposed to be like this. <laughs> but I guess this is the first, first lecture, so no questions? All right, so uh, I, I hope to end early today. But what do I expect from you? This is, well, this is an advanced course, so enthusiasm to learn, invent, invent question, and create. And I'd really like you to exercise this creativity. The research is a methodology, certainly. You, it's, you start with a problem right, to solve. You clearly define the problem. You clearly define the goal. Uh, and maybe you clearly define a hypothesis or an idea to test. Right? But it's also a lot of creativity. And creativity really comes from a lot of these other things that you do. right? Because you read the papers, and you come up with an idea. Uh, and you, you come up with it, perhaps, by questioning things. right? I mean, this is obvious. right? This course will not be as intense as some of the other courses that you've taken from me, but intense in the sense of research. And this will be a very uh, uh, discussion-oriented course. So definitely, I would like you to do this. And we'll hopefully do that. So doing great research, if I, if I have to summarize it with three things, it's really preparation plus looking out for the opportunities and finding the good opportunities, so, and plus some luck. You, you really have to have all these components to do great research in any area, in my opinion. Preparation is really required. If you don't have preparation, if you don't know the problems, if you don't, if you don't have enough uh, technical background, if you don't read papers, for example, then you'll miss the opportunities. 
because you won't, uh, you'll perhaps come up with an idea, but you may not realize the importance of it. So this and this go together really well. Opportunism is really also finding research problems that are really important is part of the opportunity, right? You, you, you got to take the opportunity. Actually, I mean, anyway, I won't do the code. But I think Richard Feynman or someone had some code about opportunity. But I'll, I'll try to find it and say it uh, the next time. Some, some really good researcher had that code about opportunity. This is, the, this is what happens if you travel too much and sleep less, and then you forget these quotes. OK, <laughs> well, I'll find it. Yishin, please remind me. Yishin is the. Are you there still? Let's see. Yes, uh, I've taken it down. Oh, OK, yeah, please remind me about the code. Okay, and luck. I mean, unfortunately, you may not be perfectly able to control this luck part, uh, but you can act, at least minimize the effect of it by preparing uh, and being opportunistic, right? So I definitely encourage you to think of research from this point of view. And I think it, it was Pasteur who said, uh, uh, chance favors a prepared mind, right? So you can actually try to bias the coin a little bit. OK, so this is what I would definitely recommend. Start the research project early and focus on it. OK, how will you be evaluated? This is not really that inter very. Well, I should fix that, right? There you go. OK, so the grades are not really that important. Well, the grades really are not that important in this course. I hope you're not taking it for the grade. But we'll have to assign a grade at the end. I hope everyone will get A's. I'm very open to that. Uh, this is what I intend to do. Most of the grades will be research project and paper reviews and presentations, 80%. 10% is class part participation. I don't know about quizzes, but you should definitely turn in quiz zero that I will assign. That's a really easy quiz. <laughs> if you don't pass that, you, should <laughs> you definitely shouldn't take this course. And exam, uh, we'll, we'll figure this out dynamically. So I'm actually, since this is a very relatively informal course, I'm uh, willing to change this. But definitely most of the grade will be research project and paper reviews. OK, is this fair? OK, but don't get caught up on grades. Get caught up on doing good research. So let me give you some guidelines. Do we want to take a break, by the way? No? Who wants to take a break? Don't be shy. OK, I'd like to give you some guidelines on paper reviews, since you'll have some assignments as well as some guidelines on projects, although we've talked a lot about the project so far. Uh, so basically, here's an outline of actually how to do a paper talk review uh, and how to write a paper even sometimes. But uh, maybe we'll talk about how to write a paper later. So first, a brief summary of the work. And brief summary should really talk about what is the problem. Problem is always the first thing, right? Whenever you write a paper, you should really talk about the problem. Uh, what are the key ideas of the paper? What are the key insights? Uh, what is the key contribution to literature at the time it was written? So we're going to read a lot of papers that are current, but we're going to read some papers that are old. So it's always important to evaluate works at the time they were written, right? Amdahl's Law was written in 1967, right? Today everybody knows Amdahl's Law, but at the time, not many people did think about it that way. Uh, what are the most important things you take out from it? So summary is a brief summary, and I, uh, it's good to structure it this way. Problem, key ideas key contribution and most important takeaways. Maybe some results also, right, in, in, in that. The other section, I think strengths are really important, most important ones. What are the strengths of the paper? Does the paper solve the problem well? But also strengths in terms, strengths can be in two ways, right? It's, it's related to the problem and the solution. Maybe the solution has really good strengths, but also related to the writing as well. So there are two aspects of each paper, the technical aspects and also the presentation-like aspects. And a good paper actually does both of them really well. You can actually write a paper that has a really good technical solution. If you're not presented well, it's kind of useless, right? Because no one will understand it. You can have a really well presented paper, but it doesn't have a technical contribution. Well, people will realize that it doesn't have a technical contribution at some point. <laughs> so it's better to have the first one, but it's better to have a paper that does both of them really well, right? So I think when you talk about strengths, it's good to comment on both. And this is, uh, think of these as bullet points, basically. Uh, three, three or four bullet points of what are the strengths of the paper. And every paper is a strength. That's always true. <laughs> so think about extracting a strength 
from the paper. It's good to be critical, uh, but it's good to be also, also recognize the strengths of papers. OK? <laughs> OK, weaknesses, uh, that's the next section. Uh, and we'll actually provide some of this review substrate. Uh, but again, this is the bullet points of what are the weaknesses. And every paper, again, has a weakness, right? At least one weakness. And again, you can think of this as two different kinds of weaknesses. Technical aspects. For example, you have a new, you're, you're reading a paper on stall time for memory scheduling, right? You, you know this from 447 and 740. What are the weaknesses? Well, one weakness is it's relatively complex, right? That's a good weakness of the mechanism itself, right? Uh, and there are weaknesses of the presentation, perhaps, right? We can, you can think of weaknesses of the presentation. It could be verbose, right? The paper is verbose. That's, that's a weakness of the presentation itself, right? Uh, so think about both types of weaknesses. And this is where you should really think critically. Uh, the weaknesses, especially the weaknesses that you identify in the ideas, uh, can enable you to uh, come up with new project ideas also, right? especially when you think of the papers that I'll assign. Think about it this way. And every paper and idea has a weakness. That doesn't mean that it's bad, right? It's just impossible to design the perfect idea. <laughs> and the next section that I'm really interested in is, can you actually do much better? I'd like to hear your thoughts and ideas about the paper when you review the paper. And maybe you can discuss what have you learned, enjoyed, disliked in the paper. And I definitely like a short and concise review, a page or shorter. Here, definitely, in this course, you can write a little bit longer than in the past courses. But it's good to be concise. So this is a good guideline for paper and talk reviews. And you can do the same thing for talks. And when you actually uh, structure a paper write-up, you can actually do something similar. OK. OK, I think we've talked about this, basically. Always think about better ways of solving the problem or related problems. That's how you can do critical, how, how you can actually uh, improve the state of the art, right? And when needed, I, I definitely encourage you to do the background reading. When you read a paper and actually you Look at the reference. So when I read a paper, I actually go through all of the references, right? It's, it's, it's almost like crazy. I open it, and I, I see a reference, and I go back, well, what is that difference? <laughs> and if it's really interesting, I go back and push it on my queue of reading. That's, so it's good to do background reading. Of course, if you do it in a depth-first manner, then you'll have a problem, right? <laughs> so you'll need to <laughs> reduce that urge a little bit. Uh, and reviewing a paper or a talk is actually the best way of learning about the research problem topic. There will be some problems that you've never been exposed to before in this course, perhaps. So this is how you can learn. And think about, while you read papers, think about forming a literature survey topic or a research proposal also. So this is something I would recommend. This is not an assigned reading, but I definitely recommend uh, this paper that was published in IEEE Computer on the task of the referee. It talks about the publication process. It's a little bit dated, but overall, Things are there. It provides guidance on how to perform technical reviews. These are a little bit different from what we're going to perform here, because there the goal is accepting or rejecting a paper. You're going to be reading papers that are mostly accepted, right? Some of them may not be accepted. But uh, the, the goal of uh, the review that you're doing over here will not be to accept or reject a paper. Right? It's to actually do the, uh, uh, provide critical thinking. And there are also a couple of other things uh, that I would definitely recommend like notes on constructive and positive reviewing. These are actually nice notes, relatively short. And notes on how, to, how and how not to write a good systems paper. And operating systems, review 1983. Uh, Levin and Riddell were the program chairs of, I believe, SOSP 1982. And based on their experiences, they decided to write this paper. And Simon Payton joins, Jones also has presentations as well as, I think it's just a presentation and a talk on how to write a great research paper. If you Google it, you'll find it. Literature survey, we'll talk about it. But more, uh, in, the, in the meantime, uh, read a lot of papers. Find focus problem areas to survey papers and do your project on. And as I said, it's best if your survey is related to your course project. And we will provide a list of project ideas and papers associated with them. And there are other ways. Uh, you can examine the provided project ideas and papers. You can read assigned papers in lectures, well, in meetings. And examine recent papers from conferences. That's, those are some other ways, actually to develop your project proposal, as well as literature survey. So let me briefly talk about the project proposal and the topics, and then give you assignments, and then we'll be done. So hopefully this will be exciting to you. This will be your chance to explore in depth a computer architecture topic that interests you, and hopefully publish your innovation at top architecture conference. This is really important. Start thinking about it from now. That's, that was the purpose of what I've discussed earlier. Interact with me and the TA, again, 
I guess this is the downside of copy-paste. It's good to correct it earlier, right? Oh, how did we get here? OK. OK. Groups of two students is fine. If you want to do it alone, you'll talk with, you'll talk with me. Basically, whatever you do related to project, you should talk with me. I'm open to a lot of ideas. And propo proposal will be due within approximately three weeks or so, maybe four weeks. We'll, we'll, we'll see. But if you want to talk about it earlier, such that you can get started earlier, definitely do so. So what is the goal of the research project? I think it's really developing new insight. Well, developing insight is the base, baseline, but new insight is better, right? Uh, solving a problem in a new way or evaluating and analyzing systems and ideas in a different way, such that uh, you can come up with insights that no one has come up with before. Uh, there are two types of uh, research projects. There may be other types or combinations too. Or you can develop new ideas to solve an important problem. You know the problem, you d define a goal, you figure out the weaknesses in the past work, and you say, oh, I'm going to develop new ideas to solve this, and rigorously evaluate the benefits and limitations of the ideas. Or you can analyze the systems of today uh, and derive insight from rigorous analysis and understanding of these systems, or previously proposed ideas. Maybe you don't have an idea to begin with. This works if you know an area if you do enough reading and have an idea already. Maybe based on what you read in 447 and or 740, you already have an idea. Oh, these people who worked on caching did great work, but they missed something really important. So I have a better way of caching. Or at least I hypothesize that I have a better way of caching, doing better reuse prediction, right? That's kind of the type one research project, right? And, and then you can actually develop that idea further and you can actually evaluate the benefits and the limitations. Or you can Based on what you read from 447 and 740, you can say, oh, uh, people have looked at, I don't know, interconnects, efficient interconnects for a while, and there are all these different topologies for interconnects, and I have no idea which one is better. So I'm going to propose a project where I'm going to look at these different topologies that are important or that make sense for some reason. I'm going to evaluate them, and I'm going to try to develop a heterogeneous topology. That could be an idea, actually, that actually gets the benefits of all of them. And the hypothesis over there is not all of the topologies are the best in everything. So um, I'm going to test the hypothesis, uh, that hypothesis. And maybe if that's true, you c uh, I'm going to develop a heterogeneous topology. I don't know what that is yet. You don't have the idea over here, right? Uh, heterogeneous topology that approximate the, approximate the different benefits. That's a, that's a perfectly valid research topic also. Here you don't have the idea because maybe you haven't done enough thinking. Maybe it's not apparent. But you do analysis and understand things such that you can develop an idea. Maybe the solution, heterogeneous topology, is not the best solution. Maybe it's something else, right? Maybe you're going to eventually decide tweaking some topology to do better. OK, that's the proposing potential new solutions based on the new insight. So these are two different types of projects. So you don't necessarily have to have a concrete idea. If you have a concrete idea, that's good. But if you don't have a concrete idea, at least you should develop a, a problem uh, to investigate. Yes, problem needs to be concrete, definitely. Uh, and once you have an idea, that those need to become concrete over time. And they need to be very clear when you write it up. Uh, and you, you'll have four weeks, three or four weeks, to be able to do this. So let's take a look at type one. Basically, what is the problem you're trying to solve? Uh, so when you do a proposal, it's always good to write down like this. What is the problem you're trying to solve? Why is it important? Uh, why, why should we care? Or why will it become important? Maybe it's not important today, but why will it become important? Why has previous research not solved this problem? What are, what are the shortcomings of previous research? And you can ca it, it's best to categorize related works, right? Previous research had these solutions to the problem. Memory interference problem, for example. Previous research tried to solve it with memory scheduling, source throttling, different kinds of data mapping, OS thread scheduling. And now you have this great approach that's much better than all of those, potentially much better. I don't know what that is. That's, but uh, that's, that's one way, right, if you actually are developing a new memory interference mitigation mechanism. And this can be your literature survey. It says will be over here, but it can be. Uh, and in the pro uh, proposal, of course, it's, you won't have a re literature survey. This will be a shorter document. So idea, what is your initial idea insight if you're doing type 1? What new solution are you proposing? Why does it make sense? How or does it or could it solve the problem better? Here you can potentially show uh, ideal results, for example, right, if actually 
if, if this idea works ideally, this is the performance benefit. You can show ideal results in the problem itself, right? If I solve this problem ideally, here is the benefit I would get. But if I solve this problem in this direction, ideally, this is the benefit I could get. So you could have multiple uh, perfect results. What is the main hypothesis you will test put based on the idea? And how will you test the hypothesis and idea? So it's good to have a plan for this. Uh, what simulator or model you will use or develop? And what initial experiments will you do? Right? And in many of the ideas where you're modifying hardware, you will need to simulate. Uh, of course, in, in type 2, you can actually uh, do other things. But here, you, you will likely simulate or develop some analytical models. And the plan, basically describe the steps you will take. What will you accomplish uh, by milestones? And this will probably change depending on how many milestones we have. And I think you can describe all research projects, regardless of however big or small they are, uh, in this fashion. Right? Even if you're inventing a new area in systems, you can actually define the problem right? and the novelty. OK, the type 2, I'll go through this really quickly. Again, problem doesn't change over here. What is the problem or phenomenon you're trying to evaluate? One example here could be, uh, for example, you're trying to characterize uh, the interaction between uh, power and reliability in modern DRAM chips. Right? We have this beautiful infrastructure that my students have developed where you can actually characterize modern DRAM chips using FPGA-based memory controllers. You can actually change everything in the controller. You can change the latencies. You can change the uh, retention time. You can change all the parameters that you can change in DRAM and test the DRAM chips. And you, can, you may want to evaluate, for example, what if uh, I change the power, if you could do that? Uh, what if I change the voltage that I supply to DRAM? How does that affect reliability, right? What are the reliability, what are the errors I get? So that could be a perfectly valid research problem in modern DRAM chips. Actually, not many people have done this study. Uh, how does it affect the retention time of DRAM, right? Um, of, of different cells at, at different voltage levels. How do I get, what, what kind of retention times do I get? So you can define a project very clearly and explain why it's important. Why is it important? Because DRAM reliability is important and DRAM power is important. Ideally, you would like to reduce power as much as possible and while keeping the same reliability. But if you're reducing power, how does that affect reliability? Right? So it's an important problem, obviously. And you can actually show the amount of energy that you spend in DRAM. Uh, how has previous research evaluated this? What are its shortcomings? Right? Well, as far as I know, there isn't a whole lot of research in this area. So that's a very novel <laughs> topic. But you can talk about other research that evaluated things related to DRAM. For example, people have looked at the retention time in DRAM without looking at power as much. What is the retention time, time distribution? How is it related to temperature? People have looked at temperature dependence. But people haven't looked at the power dependence as much. Uh, maybe you can talk about some of the other things people have done with uh, real DRAMs, testing DRAMs. You can talk about uh, pe people have characterized the latencies of DRAM, modern DRAM chips, for example with similar studies. So this could be your literature survey. Even if you don't have, uh, uh, even if you don't have papers that have worked on the exact problem that you're investigating, you can talk about the related uh, papers, right? Oh, that's what I was trying to do before. Evaluation method. How will you evaluate the phenomena idea? What experimental infrastructure will you design or will you use? How would that infrastructure enable you to reliably eval evaluate the idea or the phenomenon, right? In this case, you can use the infrastructure that we have over here. So it's very low overhead. If your goal was to design that infrastructure, that will take a long time. <laughs> It'll probably take one and a half years or two years or so. <laughs> so I wouldn't recommend that as a research project. <laughs> OK, what hypothesis will you test? Basically, once you have this infrastructure, what will you test? You can basically formulate, as I reduce the voltage goes in DRAM, I expect retention time distribution to widen, meaning uh, you'll have more variation, for example, in retention times. And I expect the retention type to become lower, maybe. And of course, you should support it. I don't, I don't necessarily believe these hypotheses, but that could be an hypothesis to test, right? Uh, and what are your plans for evaluation? What experiments will you run? Now? How will you do the analysis? And the plan, of course. And again, you can describe type 2 research projects in this fashion. OK, this is actually very similar to what uh, people, are, people write proposals for. This Heilmeier, uh, he was uh, one of the directors of Defense uh, Advanced Research Project Agency. So he actually, at, at DARPA's good times, when DARPA actually supported research in the United States, uh, actually a lot of the innovation in computing came from uh, DARPA's, uh, or the government's, strong support for research in the United States, which is reducing right now, in my opinion. 
uh, in the 70s, uh, 80s. So he was uh, one of the proponents of this kind of research. He, you would go to him and ask him for money. I want to do research in this area, and he would tell you this basically. And this is this has become uh, uh, this, uh, this has become to known as Heilmeier's catechism, uh, and this is one version of it. What are you trying to do? Tell me without using jargon, <laughs> right? And that's a good thing, right? You're trying to convince someone who's going to make these decisions, not, not necessarily technical at some point, right? How is it done today? What are the limits of current practice? Uh, what's new in your approach, and why do you think it'll be successful? Who cares? <laughs> like, why, should I, why should I give you money to do this, right, to do this research? Well, in this case, the good thing is I'll provide most of the resources, unless you ask me for a million dollars that I don't know. <laughs> but I'll provide a lot of the resources over here in this course. Well, the, the, the department will also. If you're successful, what difference will it make? What are the risks and the payoffs? How much will it cost? Well, I guess you, can, you don't need to worry a whole lot about this over here, but this is just to give you an idea of the research proposal is actually realistic. If you want to do research, people will ask you these things. How long will it take? So try to find a project that actually doesn't take two years, for example. Uh, and what are the midterm and final exams to check for success? And this is the other version. This, uh, this version I kind of like better, actually. It's much more concise. What's the problem? Why is it hard? How is it solved today? What is the new idea? Why can we succeed now? What is the impact of successful? And you can actually read this over here. Okay, some more supplementary readings that I would definitely recommend uh, when you're doing research, writing, and do, do, uh, doing your reviews. This is a paper that I had actually assigned to 740, definitely. I don't think I did it for 447. But this is one of the required readings. Uh, Dick Hamming had this uh, beautiful uh, seminar talking about his experiences in research. Uh, this is the person who developed the Hamming codes uh, and Hamming distance. Mm. Uh, he, he went back to Bell Labs in 1986 and gave this talk on how, how to do research or his experience in research and what, are his, what his suggestions are for people who want to do uh, research. And there are, there's a lot of good advice over here, and this will be a required reading. Uh, this I've already mentioned, how to write a good systems paper. There's a lot of good advice here. There's a lot of good advice here. And there's a bibliography here, some of the papers you may be able to find. Yishin, we should put all of these online. You're, we're on slide 46 if you aren't following. OK, and this I've already talked about. OK, I think we've already. OK, uh, basically, where do you get the project topics and ideas? We'll give you this handout at some point. But in the meantime, don't get delayed. Uh, start think, reading, doing the readings. I'll give you a book chapter on main memory scaling that I have uh, been writing. So you, you can, that, there's a lot of the memory related research topics. Talking with me and my students, my students are doing research in many areas that I previously mentioned. They can be a good source of ideas also, and maybe other students also. And recent conference proceedings, there may be other conferences here too. PLDI is probably a good conference too, for example. Okay, I'm going to uh, skip this because we've kind of talked about this. These are some of the other places where you can uh, find ideas on. Okay. Some assignments for next week. Any questions, by the way? We've covered the entire lecture. I guess this is, this is like gas. Whenever you have space, you cover the entire <laughs> space. So <laughs> we're going to cover the entire two hours. <laughs> this, shouldn't, this shouldn't happen all the time. But I'll give you assignments for next week, and then we can uh, conclude. And I do not know what, what day next week. We'll need to decide and check your email uh, for sure. I'd like to give you enough time such that you can read uh, and develop ideas because I'm going to do you a, a lot of assignments. So background, uh, I definitely, so there will be no lectures in this course. There, there may be some things that are related to research that I will talk about. For example, memory could be a good thing that I may talk about next week. But definitely, if you're, uh, I would recommend brush, brushing up. This is, maybe you've watched this lecture at some point, but everything is online. So you can find past uh, lectures online. Uh, but this is on your own depending on what you feel is useful. The second one, quiz zero, this is required. And this is an email. Uh, please send me an Yishin, an introduction email with at least the following. And you can probably find this, right? Your name, picture, your advisor, main research topic, your degree, when did you take 447, 740, why are you taking this course? And this, can, this, this doesn't need to be long. It can be brief in these, OK? <laughs> 
Yeah, what keeps you up at night? That's good to know also. <laughs> OK, this is due September 2nd. Uh, it's Monday after the Labor Day. And I don't know if we will have class that day, but we'll see. Uh, OK, the paper review set, which is important, uh, is this. Basically, uh, this is uh, a preprint book chapter. It's, it's about 25 pages, but it's really not that long because the format is terrible. Uh, uh, but it's, it talks about a lot of the memory system related issues as I see them and references a lot of work. Uh, so this is what I'll assign for the first reading. And please read it critically. Write a critical review online. I, I guess we'll go to the review site now, but maybe after I show you this. Uh, and be ready to discuss and present the paper next week, probably toward the uh, later part of the next week. And again, this will be discussion, right? Maybe, maybe you find something really interesting in that paper, right? There are a lot of directions and ideas in that paper. And maybe you, you, you want to talk about that, right? And we can talk about that. Uh, and you thought, since, since you'll have a lot of time to read, I'd like you to pick three papers referenced by the above paper, this book chapter, and that pique your interest. You can choose them with any algorithm that you would like to use. You can do a random selection. But three papers that are referenced by this paper, read each very carefully, just like you would do this one, and write a critical review for each online. And again, be ready to discuss and present each paper, probably not next week, but the week after that. Maybe next week also, depending on how things go. And this is due September 4th. Is this good? Or should we make the September 5th and 6th? What do you think? I'd like you to do the reading quickly so that you can actually get started thinking about projects. Because three papers, uh, Coming out of this, this is about 120 references or so. And once you read the paper, you can actually figure out uh, what, what potentially piques your interest. So this will hopefully give you a good idea of what potential research projects you can follow. And eventually, you may, you may follow none of these that you read, or no, nothing related to these. That's OK. That's also OK. This is, just, this, is the, this is the review part. But maybe this will feed your research project also. OK, we'll keep it at September 4th for now. But OK. While reviewing, I would definitely suggest thinking about project ideas, thinking critically, and exercising your creativity to solve the described problems in different ways. And maybe thinking about different problems, right? And you can dig deeper as you become curious, right? Review sites, I guess this should be linked from this review site, let's see, uh, from, from our website. Oh, it's here actually, but let me see. Paper review site. If I click on this, OK. Uh, you will need to create an account. Let's see if Yishin is still there. Yishin. Yes, I'm still. Uh, can you hear me? OK, I can hear you. Yes, it's very good. OK. So we're looking at the review site. Uh, should the students create accounts, or are you going to create accounts yes. for them? Uh, so if I have their email address, I can create the account for them. But right now, I don't have the full list of email address. OK. So OK, there are two ways, basically. Yishin can create an account for you, or you can go to this website. Well. Uh, I don't want to sign out right now. But basically, if you go to this website, if you click on it, the first thing you, they'll, uh, it'll ask you, you cannot log in like I'm logged in right now. Uh, you, you, you'll need to request an account. And if you request that account, I assume Yishin will get the request, right, Yishin? That sounds like a yes. Uh, yes. <laughs> okay. So yeah. if you create the account, about your password and then you can log in. Oh, OK. You'll directly get the uh, account, basically. You can, anyone can create an account, apparently. Well, hopefully. Uh, OK. OK, so if you go to this, if you go to Submitted Papers, well, Paper 1. Well, we'll need to upload these papers differently. <laughs> so you can write your reviews uh, for this paper, OK? So maybe the best way is actually creating a constitution. We should talk about this. Uh, and the other paper that I'll assign is you and your research. So we'll actually give you a review form also. So if you do a write review, basically some of these will not be relevant, but you can do the paper summary here, strengths of the paper, weaknesses of the paper, and mechanisms. I guess you should already filled some of these out, but this may be updated. OK? Of course, you're, I, I'm not sure about the questions to the author. <laughs> Maybe for some papers it's relevant, but for some other papers they, that may not be relevant. So we'll change the review form, but this is kind of the look and feel of the review site uh, for, the, uh, for the papers that you're going to read. 
And definitely send the three papers that you select to Yishin such that we can upload them separately to this website. I assume not everyone is going to select the same three papers. That would be very suspicious, by the way. <laughs> it could happen. There is some random pro there is some probability that it can happen randomly, right? But maybe the, a good exam question is, what is that probability? But not for this course. Name for a probability course. OK, that's the review side. But send the three papers you select to Yishin and me for uh, the next, uh, not the next assignment, but basically the second thing that I mentioned over here. OK. OK, last thing. This is another required reading. I made this required, but this is an easy reading, if you will. This really talks about, and you may have already done it if you've taken 740. So it's going to be really easy for those of you who have already done it. But it's, I think it's really important to read for those of you who have not done this reading. Okay, I guess I have a lot of redundancy in these slides. That just shows that these papers are interesting, to me at least. Okay, any questions? That's all I have. Is it interesting, exciting? You ready to do the readings? Is it a lot of reading? No? Who thinks it's a lot of reading? Not to put you on the spot, but <laughs> yeah? It's not that bad, right? <laughs> OK. OK, I guess uh, there, there won't be any meetings this week so that, such that you can actually do all of these readings and do some preparation. We'll have one meeting next week, very likely September 3rd, I'll say, such that we'll discuss some of the memory-related things. Uh, would it be interesting if I talk about some of the memory system, uh, if I summarize that paper next week? OK, maybe the tentative plan could be I, I talk about it, and then we'll discuss it. Uh, hopefully during that lecture, but if, if not, the, during some other lecture. OK? OK, let's tentatively say September 3rd is the next meeting. But if that changes, we'll uh, definitely check your email. OK. All right. I guess I'll see you next week.